pastor wanted me to share with you about what we do, and I am the director of Hope Biblical Counseling Center, and our ministry is now out of Triumph Baptist Church in Great Falls, Montana, and the pastor there is uh, Pastor Arthur Hernandez. And so the, the ministry of Hope Biblical Counseling Center is a missionary ministry, and since our retirement, we, are, we have been counseling all through COVID. We're doing things differently, of course, because of COVID. And uh, I would have never considered before uh, not doing in-person counseling. But because of the fact that COVID has changed everything, we are now doing phone counseling with people. And we have a full load of counseling. And that counseling, uh, and we have people waiting to get in. And so uh, the, the real thing that we're, we're teaching people is, are you a spirit-controlled person? Now, most, you know, many of the people who come to us aren't spirit-controlled people, but the, the, we're teaching them how to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. Now, you know, approximately 30 years ago, uh, Kim and I got concerned about the number of children that were growing up in independent Baptist churches and not going on to serve God. And statistics say that, depending on how they take them and who takes them, uh, that it's 60 to 80 percent. Well, that's a staggering number. And it's a number that greatly concerned us. So at that time, uh, we started working on a book called Rearing Spiritual Children to Serve the Savior. Pastor Starr says that when he deals with people on this subject, that this is one of the three books that he would use. And so Rearing Spiritual Children to Serve the Savior has been a great help to many people in respect to the fact that um, it, it helps them. It's, it's a manual of spirituality that how you can convey your uh, spiritual life uh, or a godly Christian life, how to have a real relationship with God, how to have a daily time with God, how to be a spirit-controlled person, and how to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. Now, that's what we start off with as far as we're concerned is how to have a real relationship with God. And this is the most important booklet that's on our book table because it starts off with the person having a real relationship with God. And without that, nothing else is going to change. And so I want you to understand that one of the things that, that bothers me greatly today, and I, I, I want everybody to get this and listen to me carefully right now, is the lack of fellowship with God. Most of the people that we deal with, many of those are in spiritual leadership positions, are not in fellowship with God. They pay very little attention to having fellowship with God. It's performance-based performance Christianity rather than having a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. Now, I would like for you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And we're going to start reading with verse 1. And this is the, this is the, the passage of Scripture that really motivated me to move forward in biblical counseling. Now, we've been doing biblical counseling for 30 years, and we started doing it before it became popular to do. Not only are we doing biblical counseling, but we teach it. And so, consequently, we're trying to help people to come out of a performance-based Christianity, one where they do not have fellowship with God, and realize that it is not the performance. In essence, it's not what you do that makes you spiritual. It's what you be that makes you spiritual. And what you be, then if you be a spirit-controlled person, then you'll do the right things. Amen? All right. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to what, folks? Edification means building up. For even Christ pleased not himself. 
Uh, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Now watch verse 4 with me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what, ladies and gentlemen? Learning, now watch, that we through patience and comfort of the what? Scriptures might have what? Hope. God wants you to have hope. During this past year, you know, uh, there's a sign uh, on our way to church that says, uh, hope is not closed. Hope is not closed. God still wants us to have hope. And He has provided that way for us to do it. Now look at verse 4 with me, and notice with me what it says. That we, through patience and comfort of the what? Scriptures might have hope. So whenever we get involved with the counselee, one of the first passages we go to is right here. And we let the counselee know that where is the answer to your problem going to be? Where's it at, folks? In the Scriptures. We believe that God's Word has the answer for every person's life. Amen? And so we're going to skillfully take God's Word, and we're going to use it in a person's life. Now, you know, many times we run across people who have ulterior motives as to why they're in counseling, or they're perpetual counselees, or they want you to wallow with them all the time. We don't do that. Our, our program is 13 weeks in length. And everybody has homework. And so they have to go through the homework and they do it every week. And they come back and we go over that with them. And the first thing that we teach them is how to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God through His Word. And how to have a daily time with God. Now once we get people up and truly get them up having a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God... 90% of their problems go away. Now, it's the other 10% that we have to pick off. But there are people that, well, you know, they'll come into counseling and they, they won't be truthful with you. And so, in our counseling program, if you're not going to be truthful, you're done. Because we can't help you if you're not going to be truthful. Okay, and also transparent with where you are. You know, we're not here to play around. We're here to see people make biblical long-term change in their life. Right. Not just play at it. And not just, you know, want to be having a feel-good situation. Now, God, there's nothing wrong with feeling good. But the whole point of it is, is if that is the whole focus of your life and not having a real relationship with God, nothing's ever going to work for you. Now, I want, you, I want to show you the, uh, another one more thing that's important. Now, the God of patience, verse 5, and consolation, grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now, I'll get back to this like-mindedness here in a minute, but I also want you to, to see in verse 6, now watch what it says. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the will of God for you in this passage? To glorify who? To God. Glorify God. Now look down at verse 13. The Bible says, now the God of hope. And ladies and gentlemen, He is the God of hope. Amen. Amen. Now the God of hope, now watch, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound, in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of who? The Holy Ghost. Now, when you talk about the Holy Spirit to many independent Baptists, they get scared. Why they're getting Bapticostal. But I want you to understand this. Do you realize that there's at least 70 things that the Holy Spirit does in your life? 70. 
Nothing's going to change, ladies and gentlemen, until you embrace the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, God, the Holy Spirit, the moment you got saved, came to indwell you. He's there for 70 different reasons in your life. And without Him working in your life and you being out of fellowship with God, He can't work in your life. Now, we tell our counselees this. Um, you know, we, we tell them to ask God three questions every day. Number one, is there any sin that stands between you and me? Show it to me. Now, Pastor Starr, do you believe if you ask God to show you if there's sin between you and him, he'll show you? Yeah. But you have to do that. It's not just, forgive me for my sins. Well, what are they? You know, presumptuous sins are sins that people have in their lives that they don't think are all that bad. And yet, they're not going to deal with it. I got news for you. If you have a presumptuous sin in your life, you're out of fellowship with God. And you're just presuming that God will do nothing about it. Well, I wouldn't be presuming that. And the reality here is this, ladies and gentlemen. So, is there any sin that stands between you and me? And listen. And when the Holy Spirit shows you that this is a sin between you and Him, you confess that sin and you repent of that sin and turn from that sin. Then secondly, I want you to listen to me carefully. We have the counselees to ask a second question. Is there any hurt in my life today that I'm allowing to control me? I want you to show that to me. How many of you have been hurt? Yeah. Everybody in here, right? Either by person or situation. And quite frankly, that's going to take place. And the Bible says... Also, in Romans 12, that if you use your gifts in the body of Christ, you're going to get hurt. Because carnal people are going to hurt you. Or carnal situations are going to be involved. And so, the reality of it is, is that you can either deal with the hurt, or you let the hurt control you, and hurt easily becomes bitterness. Now, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that we can't know our own heart. It's desperately wicked. But it also says that, in verse 10, that I, God, search the heart. So I ask Him to search my heart and show me if there's any sin that stands between me and Him and is there any hurt that I'm allowing to control me today. So think about it like this. You got up this morning and something flashed into your mind and it was about something that somebody said to you, and it might have even been years ago, and you're allowing that to control you. Now, if you allow it to control you, you're out of fellowship with God. Listen to me carefully. We tell our counselees, you have to take control of your dark side. The lost person, the lost person has... No ability to do that. And the reason why a lost person is uh, going from here to here to here to here to here to here is because today they're living for this lust. Tomorrow they're living for this lust. The next day they're distracted by this lust. And then we're distracted by this one and this one and this one and this one. As a believer with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you now have the ability to deal with that. Amen? And you have to understand that you have to take control of your dark side and not let it control you. And don't sit there and say you don't have a dark side because you have an old nature. 
It would have been great when we got saved if God had taken away our old nature, but He didn't. What He did do was give us tools to be able to deal with our old nature. Spiritual tools. And so, you know, when we got married, I know some of you have probably heard me say this before, but when we got married, my wife did an awful thing. She bought me a toolbox. <laughs> Craftsman. Nice one. A lot of tools in there. Now, I am not mechanically inclined. Me and a hammer aren't even close to being friends. Now, at our house, she is mechanically inclined. So, I read the instructions and she puts it together. Because when I seek to put it together, I have to pray. Because frustration becomes an issue, you know what I mean? And how many of y'all like that? You try to put something together? Or how about technology? Well, technology is great when it works, you know what I mean? <laughs> but when it doesn't work, it can be exasperating. And I've, we've had some of that recently, too, and I've, I've had to pray about that. Now, I want, you to get, I want you to understand so that we're teaching people exactly what I'm talking about here. But it's amazing when the light comes on. Now, you know what? There are people that, there are people that don't want to make change, and, they're, you know, and in their life, uh, they want to spin it that, you know, it's this or that or something else, but in reality... The whole point of it is they just did not want to make biblical long-term change in their life. And that happens. And then we have some counselees that go along and do pretty well for a while, and then something happens, and they go back to dealing with life the same way they've dealt with it before. In failure. Now, the third question that we have to ask our counsel needs to ask is, God, is there any bitterness in my heart today? Now, you know, the Bible says that bitterness springs up quickly and defiles many. And so we want them to deal with that and deal with it every day. And because bitterness is a root sin, we encourage them to Confess it as sin to God, but ask God to take it out of their heart. Bitterness is something that is big in the church today because a lot of people are not in fellowship with God. And they don't take it seriously. Now, you can't lose your salvation but you can be miserable as a Christian if you're out of fellowship with God. And there is, if you're out of fellowship with God, there is no ability then to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because you're grieving the Holy Spirit because you refuse to be in fellowship with God. And we have all of our counselees to read the book of 1 John. How many of you here went through the counseling training here that you were in the, yeah? Well, you know, so they get, they, they'll come back and they'll say, Pastor, do you think I could read another book other than 1 John? You know, I've read it now for 20 days. You know, the, one of the seven laws of teaching, one of them is repetition is the key to learning. And so consequently, we want you to read it because of this. 33 times in the book of 1 John, God tells you He loves you. And if there's one thing a person needs to know in their life, is that God loves them. And secondly, it is the book of fellowship. And so consequently, learning how to have fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. If. And it's not going to work if you just say, forgive me for all my sins. Because you don't really want to deal with them because there might be presumptuous sins that are there and you really don't want to deal with it. <clears throat> so with Hope Biblical Counseling Center, that's where we start. And then we teach them how to have a real time with God in His Word. And also we teach them what it means to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. That's where these booklets come in with how to have a daily time with God and how to deal with your thought life. Now, many people are out of fellowship with God because their thoughts are wrong. Hear me? Now, in the second hour of this morning, I'm going to show you how to deal with that. But I want you to realize that if you're thinking wrong and you're not seeing it as sin, it is causing you to be out of fellowship with God. Therefore, you cannot be a spirit-controlled person. We well, you know I'm busy, you know, I'm busy day, busy this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And there are a lot of people around the church that are busy doing things, but they're out of fellowship with God. And then we end up dealing with them because they're lying, they're deceiving, they're having a critical spirit. You know, I, I was thinking about that critical spirit stuff. You know, a person who's out of fellowship with God is going to have a critical spirit. Nothing's ever right. I don't like what they did about this. I don't like that. I don't like something else. This, bah, 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 bah. I don't like it. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you now, kind of go through a little bit with what we do. And with the website, um, HopeBiblicalCounselingCenter.com, we have a, a mountain of material up there. There's more than 300 audio messages on different subjects. Uh, this is a fairly new website for us in the last couple of years. I wrote it down last night. So in the last couple of years... 308,246 people have hit that website in the last two years. 308,000. Now that's a lot of people, isn't it? And think about that. That gives us the opportunity to have contact from more than 300,000 people. Now, in our program, when people, when people contact us, uh, the first thing that we let them know is this. Now, you will have to fill out an intake form. And that's about six pages in length. And it helps us to get to know you better and know exactly what's going on in your life so that we can try to be helpful to you. And then secondly, you have to sign a counseling agreement. And in that counseling agreement, it says, this is what we'll do, and this is what you're going to do. Now, you sign that because you're going to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, that helps them to realize that they need to be serious about what they're doing here. Now, if they're not serious about it, then there'll come a point where they'll not be honest with us, or they'll, you know, they won't do the homework. Now, so if they, we tell them going in, if you don't do the, if, you know, the sessions are important. So you can miss one session. But if you miss more than one session, then we'll have to move on to somebody else because that means you're not serious about what we're doing here. Now, understanding somebody could get sick, but the whole point of it is, is that at that point, one of the things I say is, 
I want you to, I, 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 here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna, I'll pray about it and you pray about it. And if you come to a point that you're serious about wanting to do this, then you can get back with us. So you have to do the homework. You have to be in the sessions. If you don't do the homework once, then we admonish you that you need to do it. And after that, again, it's, you know, if you're not going to be serious about what we're doing, then we're not going to continue with you. Because we're, if they're not serious about it, nothing's going to change and we're just wasting our time. And I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste theirs, especially because we've got a ton of people sitting back here that want to get in. And it's been amazing through the COVID scenario. So you understand this. I, I want you to all understand this in presenting our work to you today. We've had multiple missionaries who contacted us that their, ma their marriage is in trouble, and we've been able to save all of those this year. Pastors who've contacted us saying their marriage is in trouble, and they don't have any place else to go. And we've been able to help them. But we've also been able to help a lot of lay people too. Now, uh, so it's a 13-week program. And we also, our ministry's out under our local church, and there's a brochure on the back table, and there's a downloadable brochure on the website that tells about what this is about, about what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so um, here's another thing that we're doing right now during COVID is let's just say that Pastor Starr says, okay, we're going to pass out your counseling literature in our neighbor, in our, around our church. And if somebody contacts us from Brogue, Pennsylvania, then they are required to attend this church at least one service a week while they're in our counseling program. Amen? One service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. They have to do that. So we're also helping local churches then uh, across the country with, uh, you know, and that takes a little bit of the load off of the pastor because... Many pastors are not interested in counseling that much, or they're afraid of it. And because of the fact that they, in Bible college, have not been taught how to counsel anybody. And so they, you know, and by the way, 90% of what we do is deal with people's issues in the ministry, and we weren't actually taught how to do that in Bible college. And so it's one of the reasons why we teach counseling. Because if you're in the ministry any length of time, you're going to have to deal with people and their issues. Amen? You're going to have to. So um, we also, on the website, um, we have um, a YouTube channel that has now been started. And it's growing rapidly. They have about 50 YouTube uh, videos up right now on different counseling subjects. So people can go and listen to a 20-minute video or listen to a full-length message um, in respect to that. Uh, there we have a weekly email that we send out, and thousands of people around the world get that right now, and missionaries. And also our literature, all of this material that's on the, the book table, we have 16 books and booklets that we've written. It's been translated into 31 different languages around the world by missionaries. And they're using it to help their people. 31 different languages. Now, the counseling center, uh, the counseling conference, we've had people come from 19 different foreign countries, including Israel. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have now went through the counseling training. So that now that I know that if we get a call from Israel, I've got somebody there. If we get a, and the next counseling conference will be uh, in September in Mullingar, Ireland. And so it's not only the United States, but Canada and other places around the world. Now, the whole point here is, is that we're in this to help people, to encourage people to give them real biblical answers, to see them 
make long-term biblical change in their life. And we, uh, uh, we are, our current counseling load is huge. And we're, uh, wait, we have people waiting in line now to get in. And uh, so we're, we're praying and looking at different ways that we can be helpful. But the website is very interactive. And many people can get help by just going to the website. They can click on the website and uh, click on the audio scenario, type in a, um, the word marriage as an example, and all of the messages come up that are on marriage. The YouTube channel is just the same way. So uh, we are, we're here to help people to have tools. Now, we got about a couple minutes here left. I just want to say this to you. We're here to give people hope. Doesn't mean we're always successful. Now, the last thing that I will tell you about, this is the most recent book. It's called Dealing with Domestic Violence. Now, I want you to understand that um, domestic violence is not just a worldly issue. There are many people within independent Baptist churches that have been involved in domestic violence. And so as this has become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue, you know, I started, I started looking at some of it and I started praying about what to do. I want you to listen to this with me. And I want you to understand the need for hope and help in people's lives. Did we get it? Okay, I'm going to read this and then we'll do it. Okay. One in four women. Now, listen carefully. Uh, per the NISVS, on average, nearly 20 people per minute in our country is physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. During one year, that equates to more than 10 million women and men. One in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner contact, uh, sexual violence, and an intimate partner stalking with impacts such as injury, fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, use of victim services, uh, contraction of sexually transmitted diseases, etc. One in four women and one in several men have been victims of severe physical violence, beating, uh, burning, strangling by an intimate partner in their lifetime. The presence of, of a gun in domestic violence situations increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Only 34% of the people who are injured by intimate partners receive medical care for their injuries. Christians are involved in domestic violence at a serious rate. And so, not only do we deal with helping people to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God, we also help people that are involved in domestic violence. And it's an amazing thing to me. In fact, we, we have it here, but one of the testimonies that we have, and we've talked to the uh, wife in that situation, has dramatically changed her life. I want you to listen to me. Every day of her life, growing up, she was beat by an alcoholic father and a wicked stepmother. She was only allowed to take a bath once a week. So she grew up in domestic violence. She married domestic violence. 
and was beaten consistently. She came for help with to Kim. Kim led her to the Lord. Um, she had been so abused that she didn't even know how to take care of herself with uh, doing, um, cl you know, cleaning or, you know, personal hygiene. When we met her, she was living in a house with no furniture in it and clothes strolled all over the floor and mattresses on the floor and that's where they slept and she had three children. Do you think anybody like that could even change their life? That's what she said. Do you think, always kept saying, do you think a person like me? She was talking to us on the way down here. She's going to travel to uh, Great Falls uh, in the summer to the meeting that's going to be out there. And as she was talking to us on the way down here, I want you to listen to me carefully. It took six years to help her. Six years. Today, I remember when she bought her first, she came in, told me her tax check came, and what should I do with it? And I said, well, what do you think you should do with it? And she said, do you think I could get a kitchen table? I've never had a kitchen table before. Do you think it would be okay for me to get one? Well, yes. And she cried when she got it. Fast forward now. She's 55 years old. She's bought her own bed, her own couch, her own tables and everything. She just bought a new car. She bought her own home. She is now the top salesperson for Verizon Wireless phone selling in, a, in their center in Anderson, Indiana. What a dramatic story. By the way, she was also responsible for seeing 52 people get saved last year. Praise God, right? People can make biblical long-term change. Amen? They can do that if they desire to do that. But you know, there's always the negative folks. There's always the folks that always have got something negative to say. And when we come to that point in our life, ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about whether or not we're really in fellowship with God. And I'll take this to the next level in the next session. Okay, let's see if we got it. All right. Once upon a time, there lived an angry man who justified his anger as a righteous anger. It didn't matter what others thought, for obviously they were wrong and, well, he was right. Pride was killing him, and he didn't even know it. Blinded to the truth through self-deception. Well, this young man had grown up in church. He was saved at an early age, but trained through the example of his church that anger, bitterness, resentment, were all acceptable as long as you looked the part. Well, it's a little bit of how I was prior to understanding what the Word of God truly says on the topic of anger. When I got married, my wife and I, we had our first child. We had an argument about how to discipline. Her way, God is love. We discipline in love. The rod, absolutely. But always for the child to help them see their sin and correct their behavior. My way, Oh, we're going to correct some behavior. God is full of wrath and he must judge sin. I need to make my children fear God. Fear and anger led the charge. Well, after all, this is what my childhood church taught me through their example and their preaching. I was introduced to Brother Terry Coomer through my pastor. 
I had scheduled an academic training course for the week of August 2015. I was planning on attending and needed the certification for my position at the church. However, late one night, my pastor called me and told me plans were changing. We'd now be going to the National Hope Biblical Counseling Training Conference in Little Rock, Arkansas. I thought, who, me? Uh, why do I need counseling training? I know what the Bible says. Upset and angry, but respectful on the outside, I canceled all of my plans and booked my rental car and the other rental cars. Our hotel accommodations were made. Our plane tickets were purchased. Little did I know that my life was going to change drastically. You see, just prior to this, in January of 2015, I had had to send my oldest daughter to a boarding school 1,500 miles away because she refused to listen to me. She had gotten herself caught up in sin. My wife couldn't help her. She refused her. She refused our pastor's counsel, would lie straight to his face. And anyone else, simply... Somewhere along the lines, I had lost her heart. I don't know when it happened, but somewhere in the past, I lost it. I could be like many people and won't blame it on others. Yet the truth was, I was not the man that I was supposed to be. Anger controlled me. Proverbs twenty five twenty eight says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. That was my life. What I didn't know was I was on a fast track to lose everything. My walls were crumbling. My city was broken. My marriage, my other children, my ministry were all going to crumble. I didn't know when it would crumble. I didn't know when it would happen or how, but I, knew, I now know it would have. You see, God was not the Lord of my life. I was. I was blinded to my own sin. Through God's grace, I, I went to the conference and I came back a changed man. I truly learned what all the Bible says about anger, not just the select few verses I wanted to hear. Be ye angry and sin not. I learned how to have a real, an intimate, personal, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. When I read Dr. Coomer's booklet on how to have a real relationship with God, I broke down. Truly repented and changed you see, sure, I knew the Bible. I read it every day. I memorized it. I could quote it. I studied it. I grew up in church, but it wasn't truly changing me. In some ways, yes, it was changing. But see, only the areas I wanted it to change. Once I understood Pastor Coomer's method of Bible study and really started asking God to search me and know me. Before I jumped into the Bible, God speak to me. And I started to grow and I started to overcome the key was I started listening to God instead of blocking him out, listening to God, and allowing him to lead me, allowing him to, to point out areas of my life that didn't line up with his word. Through tears, I wrote a five page letter to my daughter asking her for forgiveness and really pouring my heart out to her. I pleaded with her to tell me what I did wrong, how I could avoid the same mistakes with my five other children. Through this, and many other times, I began to repair our relationship. Though we were 1,500 miles apart, I really focused on changing, and showing her I was a different dad. My life was different. My family was different. My ministry was different. Because I was different. It wasn't other people, it was me. I was now walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of my flesh, which in my case were anger and pride. Since this time, my daughter graduated high school as salutatorian. She's enrolled in our church's Faith Bible Institute program while taking additional college courses online. She sings in our choir. She teaches in our Master Clubs program. She's a, a teacher's aide in our school. She's active for Christ. She's got a burden for lost people, a desire to glorify God with her life. Just a few years prior, she didn't really care about God at all. She was saved, yes. She had no doubt and I had no doubt. She received Christ by faith, but had allowed sin to, to corrupt and, and thwart the fruit God was trying to bring. 
She knew God was convicting her. She just didn't want to listen. Now she's different because I'm different. Because of Brother Coomer's conference, because of Brother Coomer's counseling, because of the guidance and the, the wisdom that God has given to Brother Coomer. I'm so thankful for Hope Baptist Church's National Biblical Counseling Conference. Greatest week of my life. I'm so thankful to Jesus Christ, my Lord, for his grace and his mercy. God bless. Thank you for joining us by way of the internet today. We're so glad that you were able to be with us and we pray that the service was a blessing to your heart. Even though the sermon is over, our service is not over. At the end of our service, we give an opportunity for people to respond and come to an altar and pray over what God dealt with them about. Sometimes people come to call upon Christ and to be saved. Others come to make a decision for Christ regarding their Christian lives. Others come to call out to the Lord about special needs and situations in their lives. Maybe God has dealt with you today about some specific area of your life. I invite you to make an altar right there in your home, a quiet time before the Lord where you pray to Him and respond to Him about what He has spoken to you about. If you made a decision for the Lord today, we would be glad to hear about that decision and or answer any questions you have today about the message that was preached. You can contact us by way of email at info at mountziononline.org or by way of phone at 717-927-9227. Again, we thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to you joining us again for our live stream weekly on Sundays at 1045 a.m. and on Sunday evenings at 645 p.m. If we can meet a need in your life, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. And God bless you. Oh, oh.